you ended here. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's just a great pleasure and honor great. to, to have Jerry so. Kearns here and to have all of you gathered. Um, Jerry is professor in How do I art. Get something on here? in the so, art, art history and architecture and department, um, and also director of NIPOP, the uh, New York Professional Outreach Program. Uh, 22 years in its uh, existence, um, Jerry's oh, yeah, understood the importance of having in our digital era when everyone has, you know, the era of received images, the importance of having direct contact with up, art, so art objects, artists, galleries. You're supposed to um, show, sorry. <laughs> um, supposed to show. And uh, it's been incredibly important for his, uh, you know, the uh, mentorship that he's given to these great students who are now many of, after 22 years, professional artists and uh, museum gallery professionals in their own, in their own right. Um, and so Jerry has brought them to New York to experience the, the real, the art world. And I, in some ways I see that we're the reverse direction, bring the art world here to, um, to Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, we're the only museum on an ongoing basis um, showing national international art uh, in our temporary exhibitions as well as the permanent collection. Um, and I guess that's where this evening's talk will center on. Uh, it's this permanent collection that is expanding and has grown just recently thanks to uh, Exit Arts uh, through Jerry's Good Graces donation that's come to our permanent collection. Eight portfolios, um, just the tip of the iceberg that's being shown in our um, in our recent acquisitions exhibition. So um, Jerry uh, and I have other goals in mind, how we could have synergy between NIPOP and the UMCA. Um, it's exciting to think about how young professionals, whether they be the UMass grad students, young professionals in the art world, could connect to our program here. Um, so we're looking forward to future collaborations with, with Jerry and NIPOP. Um, I think I'm going to turn this over to Jerry now. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank Loretta for her kind words there and for the, a, a really wonderful work that she's done since taking over the museum. And she, she really has moved it uh, forward leaps and bounds into an international uh, venue that we can all be really proud of and the program she's put in, putting together. And I'm really pleased that as part of a the effort with the NIPOP program, we keep trying to develop it to have, to have a wider agenda and footprint in terms of engaging the relationship between uh, an education and aesthetics and what one's going to do with that education once one's graduated. And uh, the museum and the NIPOP program and the art department, are, uh, we're working uh, toward an exciting uh, curatorial program. Uh, that where we will have young curators in New York putting together exhibitions of emerging art, and then we will be leasing that, uh, that work and sending it to schools around the country as part of our uh, outreach agenda. And we're happy to be working with Loretta, uh, Loretta on that. Thanks to Eva and Craig for getting all of this together so that I could be here and uh, talk with you this evening. I'm here for several reasons. What's the matter, dear? I'm just moving. My wife, Nora. I'm moving the arrow out of the <laughs> uh, The print portfolio, just a little bit of a background of that and of Exit Art. Exit Art uh, had a life of 30 years. Uh, 30 years, uh, about a, a year and a half ago, unhappily, uh, a co-founder, Jeanette Emberman, lost a two-year struggle with leukemia and passed away. And Exit Art, at that point, I have been a member of the board. I'm a founding member of the board. It was Jeanette and co-founder Papa Colo's wishes that Exit Art not continue. So we've had to, uh, in a sense, liquidate a 30-year organization and do it properly. Uh, so that its legacy remains intact. Uh, part of the history was this series of portfolios, which looks like it started about in 1995. I, thought, I think there must have been 11 or 12 altogether, I'm not sure. Each portfolio, print portfolios, 
uh, had eight artists in it, some emerging artists, some very well established, some quite, quite well known. And uh, these were part of the fundraising agenda for exit artists, not uncommon common at all for institutions of that ilk to raise funds, that, that being a nonprofit institution, so no works are for sale and so forth. So funds are quite frequently raised with these portfolios where artists who are supportive and who have been friends of the program and whose careers have been affected by the program in these institutions give back by giving prints to portfolios which are then sold and used as the funding source for the organization. Exit Arts portfolios were extremely popular and highly successful. I, I can't possibly name the number of museums that they're in, but I know that they're in every museum in New York. I know that the Whitney now has a complete set, and I know that UMass has uh, eight portfolios, uh, which uh, I'm thrilled to have played a little part in helping that uh, be here. It's a proud uh, moment for me because Exit Art, not only was uh, I a member of the board and uh, participated there a long time, but uh, uh, Jeanette and Exit Art were uh, extremely uh, important to the NIPOP program. That's an image of Jeanette when she was about 30, around the time of the founding of Exit Art with, with Papa Colo. Uh, when we started uh, the NIPOP program about 22 years ago, uh, it it's, was centered in my loft. We would meet there on the Lower East Side and then we would head out into the city. And we often went to Exit Art for over that 30 year period, at least once a year. Uh, we would go and Jeanette would generously uh, <clears throat> talk with the students and uh, give a sense of some of the reality of what it would be to come to New York and begin a career. <clears throat> That's Papo Colo on the left and Jeanette on the right in the grill, which was one of their favorite vacation spots for many years. When I first met Jeanette in around 1981 or two, I said, how did you meet Colo? She said, well, uh, she was a curator then at the Bronx Museum. And uh, she said, I went to his studio, which was then on Canal Street. Uh, and it was in August very, very hot day in August. And she said, I knocked on the door and the door opened and here was this giant in a pair of cut off shorts with two Great Danes standing with him. And she said, there was all this flesh and all this sweat and there was this music playing and I went in and I never came out. <laughs> Jeanette and Colo uh, were very, very aware as individuals and as couples of the notion of, of uh, image and the creation and use of image and, the, and a critique and dialogue of image and of the importance of self-image and creating an image within the art scene of New York of, them, of their own persona <laughs> as well as the kind of work uh, that they exhibited they always reminded me of something like just kind of post-World War II film noir-like movie or, or something in, in, in their dress. It had a kind of exotic style to it and a very kind of fashion, elegant quality to it and a slightly kind of uh, outsider tone to it. Jeanette was born uh, in the Orthodox uh, Jewish community of Brooklyn and lived her younger years there. And as she would put it, she escaped to Manhattan to go to NYU uh, for her PhD in uh, art history. Colo was born in uh, Puerto Rico and left home at 17 to become a merchant marine. Traveled around uh, the world for a period of five or six, seven years and ultimately came to New York and began his career as a painter. They met about 1978 or, or 79 and the project came together, so to speak. One of the things about Exit Art and its long term is a very romantic enterprise. Romantic in the sense that we talk about art as coming from romantic traditions. That is to say they were really interested in art that talked about the culture, that, that engaged political, social, 
issues as well as uh, economic, spiritual uh, aspects of creativity and so forth. But they really were into the story and to art that engaged the story of the, of the culture. It's important, Exeter had a, it, well, the, well the name Exeter right away implies a kind of outsider leaving something, you know, come, leaving. They always talked about every exit is an entrance. You have to leave one definition to enter another definition. I think that was very central to them. I think also their, their own uh, particular histories, uh, being born uh, not in a sort of mainstream middle of America kind of uh, history or place or location or ethnicity or, and so forth, but coming from where they did around the edges of the culture and working uh, in the New York mainstream, uh, the notion of an, being an outsider, of being someone who, who looks at the whole from the edges and comments and critiques and, and becomes part of it in that day. They were very theatrical people, as you can see in, uh, in these images that came later on. This is an image of them at the first exit art space on, Lo on uh, Broadway down below Houston Street. And it's the kind of thing, it, it, they really became, exit art was these two people. And it uh, started, ex uh, Kolo got a grant to, to make a book from the in, uh, National Endowment to the Arts. They took that money and rented a space and started uh, the history of exit art. So seeing them in the windows with the city outside struck me as a kind of interesting symbolic uh, portrait of the two. Exit Art began exhibiting before they had a space, and it was in the early 80s. They got the space in 84. Uh, Teaching High, some of you may have seen his show at the Museum of Modern Art a year or so ago, recording his famous one year performance. Teaching leaped outdoors in New York City for one year in the year 81, 82. He never entered a building. Uh, and uh, survived in the streets, made no recordings, no history or anything like that. It was a process of extreme endurance and another outsider kind of image. He, he, he became uh, very well known a, a year or so later. Some of you, might, if you know that period of our history, he spent a year tethered to the performance artist Linda Montana with a 15-foot rope, which was tied around both of their ankles and they lived together and never left that rope for a year. Uh, one could have a long and interesting conversation about the meaning of that kind of uh, endurance. It was my good fortune to have one of the first uh, one-person shows in the new space on Broadway in 1985. Uh, Exit Art's agenda was not only to represent uh, individuals who by the nature of their identity were cast uh, out of the mainstream, but also uh, imagery and types of work and approaches to uh, ideology and so forth. Uh, it was not easy to get a show at XR. Jeanette would come and talk to you for about two years, and then maybe <laughs> she might do something with you. It was, a, it was a slow process for Jeanette. She had to get to know what you were thinking in the long run. Uh, what she thought of you in the long run and, and uh, the work. What followed was a series of very important one-person shows at Exit in its first 10 years or so, introducing and uh, a lot of people whose names and imagery uh, you will come to recognize uh, from here. Jane Hammond uh, is uh, in an, uh, Martin Wong, uh, many of you I hope know, one of the leading painters of the 1980s. Uh, Jane Hammond also, uh, currently with LaLong Gallery and here in New York. David Hammond's a huge uh, name in the history of the last 20 or 30 years of American art. Juan Sanchez. Christoph Wachinchisco, Disco, Wadisco. Uh, teaches over at uh, MIT, I believe, still. A, a really uh, important in working in the environment, out, taking work to the streets, engaging the the dialogue of the streets and the dialogue of cultural history. Jimmy Durham, uh, Native American artist, great prominence. Cecilia Vacuna, uh, from, I want to say, 
Venezuela initially, and then an artist in New York. David Wanarovich, another name that uh, should ring a bell with you if you're a student of contemporary art. Archie Ran, Nancy Grossman, and her famous uh, song, uh, Stitch Leather Heads. John Fechner, Willie Birch, and the last uh, one-person show is a uh, young uh, contemporary uh, artist shows with Ron Feldman, Galvey, Rico Gatz. And all of these artists de de dealt with, in, in one way or another, engaged the cultural dialogue, engaged the social dialogue, explored different uh, relationships to figurative art and the meaning of the figure in uh, contemporary art. This is an image of Jeanette. Uh, I think it was made around 1990, if I can read this thing. It, it, the first show that uh, Jeanette Colo ever did was called Illegal America, and it was about 19, uh, early 80s, 82, 83. It was at the Franklin Furnace in, in, in New York, and it, it was an exhibition of art that had been in some way censored or had come in contrast with the laws of various uh, situations and, and, and times. And these were uh, artworks that might have uh, had a problem with being out in the street or community property. Maybe the, maybe the content uh, was, was uh, gender-wise or racially or whatever. They got this show together and, put, and uh, that was the first show that they did. And they restaged it again some years later. I think it's like a humorous photograph, obviously. That's Jeanette there as the Statue of Liberty with the coal miners light kind of thing. It's the kind of thing people used to work under cars with and so forth. There's a kind of class suggestion there about that light. Her uh, little garment there suggesting the statue. And it, it talks about Colo and Jeanette, a kind of muse-artist relationship. He used her frequently in images uh, in the early part of the history of Exodar. Exodar was very much about uh, looking at the, as wide as it could, as wide as it could, the spectrum of contemporary expression. So objects, paintings, sculptures, installations were a mainstay, as well as performance, poetry, uh, films, et cetera. This is from an early uh, performance piece featuring uh, Jeanette again. They liked to do shows which combined all of these things, put, put, put a cacophony of, uh, of works together, performance films, videos, paintings. They wanted to like really <coughs> mix these things up. At the time that they were doing these things, uh, they were, uh, it was unusual. Uh, years later, it became um, uh, much more ordinary. That's Jeanette again. It's all of Colo's. Colo did all of the graphics over the history of 30 years for, uh, for exit art. They would often, in, or, uh, or with some regularity, invite out uh, curators from the outside to come in and, and organize uh, programming for them, as in the case of, of this exhibition. The hybrid state, I had the pleasure of being invited to be in that one, I believe. Uh, they begin to experiment with the, with the form of the exhibition itself, like the kind of, what would you might say, the, uh, the pyramid of uh, decision making and the roles that people played. You know, you basically have the artist, the curator, the installer, you have the collector, the writer, the, cr the critic, that, that kind of paradigm of uh, ind individuals involved. And there also was a thing of like, you know, I made my artwork and I put it over there and you put yours over there and everybody had their nice little space and everything. They tried to experiment with bringing all of these things together. So Colo invited artists that he knew and respected to uh, bring works in and then he would talk with you and you would work out an installation involving parts of things from him, maybe parts of another artwork. And then and, and it would become an ensemble-like a presentation of where it was difficult to tell who the author was of any given uh, installation in a show. Performance art was known for, it is known for a wide range of activities. One of the enduring aspects of performance art is uh, it is a time-based art and it goes on for 
different periods of time, sometimes a microsecond, sometimes very, very long. There's a strong history of very interesting stuff in performance that uh, goes on for very long times. <clears throat> Some of you might know of Chris Burden sleeping in a uh, bus station locker or, for, or being put up on a shelf for days or weeks with no food, all of these kinds of things. I wish I had time to talk with you about why that would mean something, let's say, during the Vietnam War. What would it, an artist who isolated themselves in a very dark, confined situation for a period of time, what kind of references that could have in the culture. But the, the notion of endurance, a very, very important part of uh, performance history, and Exeter it worked with it in a number of ways. They also, uh, uh, Jeanette and Colo, experimented, as I said before, with the ingredients of, of the exhibition itself. And one of the ideas that they had was, uh, come let the artists live in the gallery. So for like six weeks, artists came and lived in the gallery, and a number of them were from our school. I don't know if I can read the list up there, but Michael Tong, as I remember, was one of the folks who was one of our students at the time who was invited to come and uh, be part of Living in the Gallery show. Another idea was, uh, this is the one where they, they invited uh, well-known curators. You can see Rob Store up there and Jeanette, I don't know who that is over there, but they brought in these curators. Everybody curated uh, a first element of the show. The show was up for a period of time. Everybody had to come back and alter that installation in like two weeks. They had to come back and in some way recurate it. <laughs> okay, so it, it introduced a kind of less static notion of one person makes a choice and then that's up and you close the door, take it down, you know, so it engaged that sort of thing in a really interesting way. You also had some of the largest reputations and uh, <clears throat> personalities uh, in New York City art world working together. So it would get kind of interesting at times. Uh, this is one that I had a pleasure of participating in, and uh, it was having artists uh, curate. Greg Klein, Tom Matsudo, and Kate Teal, not from our school, and Nora York, my wife, did a beautiful performance piece with Tom Matsudo's uh, sculptures. So that was a, I would say in the 30 year history, we had around 20 U, former UMass and UMass artists who were in exhibitions at Exeter. That's pretty amazing. There's no other school in the world that could say that, I'll tell you that up front. <laughs> the other thing is uh, we had about a dozen or more interns who worked there for extended periods of time. Exeter, the, the idea of NIPOC and the idea of uh, coming together at Exeter is New York City is part of your classroom here. New York City is part of this campus. It has been for 20 years. You go to school here, and those of you who participate in the program go to another aspect of the campus. It's not a visit to go to the museums and stuff. It's to go to school, to go to the campus, and that's a very important. And Exit Art played a very important role in us being able to build that idea into our school. Uh, this was having collectors curate a show. So they got together some of the better known collectors in New York and let them bring in their ideas. Now they had different agendas. The, each, the artists had an agenda when they curated. The curators had an agenda when they cur curated. And you can bet the collectors had an agenda when they curated. And all those were different agendas. And this map of exhibitions over a period of four or five years was very helpful look at all of the power relationships in that dialogue of how exhibitions take place. And this was uh, an important part of their thinking. This was a very controversial photograph at the time that it first appeared downtown. This was an exhibition of art by women. The title 1920 refers to the year that the uh, Voting Rights Amendment was passed. And that's Jeanette uh, there and another Colo photograph. It was kind of fun because uh, a number of women were upset about that photograph, yet there it was as the poster for a show about women's work. So it had a kind of complicated dialogue uh, 
surrounding it. Jeanette, by the way, loved it. <laughs> this is another f image of Jeanette and Colo. Dirty pictures. One of the uh, aspects of X art was to look at gender uh, as an ongoing question, the changing attitudes and relationship that the culture has to complicated issue of gender and power and sexuality and who controls who and what and so forth. And Exart did a number of shows uh, that uh, somehow engaged that dialogue and Dirty Pictures was one of them. You know, as you know, or you probably know from your history courses, uh, younger ones here, uh, the 1990s in New York, uh, the art world, uh, as well as uh, other parts of the country, decimated by the AIDS uh, epidemic and uh, the horror of that. And we all lost a number of close friends and relationships. And uh, it was a very tough time. And it, it, the only thing of any positiveness that could come out of it was that the image of uh, gay men and <coughs> lesbian women and various other uh, ways of equating a gender uh, came to the fore and, and became an open question in a lot of ways. And uh, at Exit Art, that dialogue went on uh, in a number of exhibitions. And I've just chosen here tonight a few of the announcements to, uh, to raise that with you. Wild Girls was uh, part of that notion. There was bad girls and wild girls, and they had all these these kinds of names going around at the time. Uh, basically, it was a giving women, or not giving, <laughs> but uh, recognizing the right of women to control all ex aspects of their destiny and to uh, uh, make their own decisions about their, their gender and reproduction and all of those kinds of things. And these, these images and this art <coughs> was there to engage those issues. Jeanette's eyes, by the way. Of course, 9 11 uh, hit us all, all of us who were there in the city and throughout the nation and the world. You know, it was one of the changing points in human history of the 20th century and uh, on. Uh, Exeter Art did the first exhibition anywhere to have anything to do with the 9 11 disaster. And what they did, it was an important kind of moment because they used it to begin using the internet to curate, and they hadn't done that before. And at this period of time, they began to experiment with their power, <coughs> taking different relationships to their power as the, uh, you know, the bosses of this show that was going on at Exeter for a other time. And they, in a way, kind of let go of some of that, and they began to curate by having open calls for work. And this 9-11 this, uh, uh, reaction show was the first of those that I recall. I, I believe it was for sure. It went around the world, the internet. <clears throat> they got something like 700 artists uh, who sent, they asked for eight and a half by 11, who sent in works from all around and put up a show. It was a spectacular. Uh, uh, memorial and it, it echoed it, if you were in the city around the, around that time you you will remember downtown especially around the hospitals and stuff there are all of these <clears throat> uh, memorial sites where people put up imagery of uh, pictures photographs poems and so forth of missing uh, family members and loved ones and so forth and uh, at exit art that same kind of serious memorial and artists taking a a clear voice in relationship to what had happened. <coughs> Exit Art uh, called itself a cultural space more than a gallery. And the, one of the manifestations of that was they would do fre frequently do shows that involved uh, organizations and exhibitions and histories far beyond their own. And uh, a, a show like this, our activist posters covering, covering a over a 40-year period of time. And they would research these things intensely, uh, uh, call in networks and so forth, and put together these exhibitions. 
And they had a real advantage over other kinds of spaces that were survey-like or museum-like spaces that they could move much faster than most spaces could, given budgets and agendas and time and booking and things. So they could come up with an idea and they could have a show up in six months or eight months where uh, most institutions could not move that rapidly. So they were quite frequently out in front on a lot of things because they had this ability to move rapidly. Um, and they were able to, they were connected to the world of artists and art uh, very directly. It was a very much a, a kind of close network of literally uh, hun uh, several hundred people who were feeding into it constantly. And as time went on, Exit Art, after its first 10 years or so, I, I know because I sat and heard these conversations, frequently phone calls would come uh, to Exit Art from uh, the really big major institutions of art around the country and they would be looking for work and people and ideas and, and, and stuff like that. So it had a really strong impact on the larger art community. Fever was an exhibition, a group exhibition, uh, that also featured UMass artists, Dan Zeller's career, Elizabeth Hall, <coughs> and Karen Domainish all exhibited uh, in that show. Uh, Geometric Days, uh, one of the last group shows at uh, Exit. Uh, Jeff Miller, a recent uh, graduate student of ours, was uh, selected for that uh, really terrific exhibition. Some of you may know that in the four or five, last four or five years or so, uh, abstraction and geometric art and so forth is getting another a fair hearing in the art world after being uh, kind of pushed aside by figurative media, installation, video, and so forth. We're, we're having a a kind of recy uh, recycle is not a good word, it's the way art works, but we're having a relook at, a reinvention of it. And Jeff Miller, one of our young artists, is in the city now, and we were happy that he was able to get in that show. <coughs> Alternative Histories was one of the last uh, major shows that exit, and I think it was about a year and a half or so ago. Oh, and it was a look at all of the alternative spaces in New York City over about a 30 year period of time. Uh, and you can see there are a lot of them. When one talks about the art world, we're usually talking about museums and galleries and stuff. Uh, but those who are uh, experienced with that world know that there are many spaces and histories that are part of the uh, professional scene uh, that are not part of uh, commerce directly. Forbidden Films X has a really strong history of showing films, they were usually films that were hard to see uh, anywhere else in the city. It was the first uh, space to uh, organize a survey of uh, video and film works of Beckett and the history of Beckett's uh, production. This an exhibition of films from Chile and the time of Pinochet and so forth, films that were uh, exiled, hidden, couldn't be seen. Uh, this was part of what Exit did. This is Jeanette, again. I just put her up there because we owe her so much. Uh, we owe her a lot here at this school, even those of you who don't know her. Uh, she gave us a tremendous platform, uh, a tremendous gift of her energy and personality for so many years. and. Uh, we will miss her greatly, and we will miss Exit Art. Uh, there's a book, I believe it's coming out of MIT Press next spring, uh, about 300 pages of pictures and texts and so forth, uh, documenting that, the history of, uh, of uh, Exit Art. Colo, this is him, Francisco Colon, Papo Colo, uh, he's uh, still cooking after you can imagine uh, the last couple of years. Uh, uh, he, uh, he made a beautiful, one of the most beautiful installations I think I've ever seen of small, he took polar, hundreds and hundreds of photographs of Jeanette over their life together. And he made a beautiful installation at her memorial service at Exit, which I understand is going to the Jewish Museum and we'll, we'll have a display there next year. 
He currently has an exhibition of his own drawings and so forth at the Clock Tower in Lower Manhattan. If you know that space, there's a beautiful installation of uh, recent drawings of Colo and, uh, by Colo, and he is working uh, on uh, a series of theatrical uh, productions. He, he's a playwright and a director, uh, and I'm not sure who that is on his lap. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to talk. Be happy to entertain any questions or cover anything that I might have left out that you might have wanted to hear about the uh, exit art. I must have missed this, but how did you actually uh, first meet Janet and Papo? I met Colo first. Uh, Lucy Lepard and I were working together in the early 80s. And uh, we were curating an exhibition for the 1199 Union, which is a hospital workers union in New York. And she and I were co-curating in their little art gallery there. And we wanted to do a show of a contemporary Latino artist. And we heard of Colo. And uh, we went to that same loft on Canal Street. <laughs> and uh, there he was with those dogs and those shorts and, he, and these beautiful paintings that he was doing at the time. And as a consequence of meeting him and working with him for that exhibition, <clears throat> within a few months I met Jeanette and uh, you know, began our, a long friendship. I, I, I mean, the, the students who are here, if you've had a, a, an iPod with me, uh, uh, you, you've heard me say a lot of times, you know, that, like, like really pay attention to your friends uh, if you are interested, uh, whatever profession you're interested in or whatever aspect of the profession, cherish your friends. Like if you want to know who your art network is, turn around and look at them. They're sitting next to you, you know. And, and uh, the other thing is uh, you're part of a generation. We're all part of a generation, like it or not. We have a certain window in certain periods of time, the generation that we're part of, there's a certain set of ideas in the air, a certain set of ideas that, that gain credibility and people are interested in and so forth. And, it, and, and your generation works and gnaws on those ideas from their perspective. And so those friends that you're being kind to are part of that generation, they're gnawing on those ideas. I hope I gave a sense of that's how exit art really worked. It, it, the art world is multiple times bigger now. It's global. It's so complicated. It's so wealthy at the top. It's a whole different ball game. But at, at its base, at, at the level of creativity and involvement, it's the same as it was 30 years ago when Jeanette Nicolo founded Exit Art. And uh, you just keep those two ideas. You're part of a generation and you're part of a set of friends and you'll do well. Yeah. Uh, do you know how Jeanette's family reacted to her? Did they ostracize her? Yes, they did. Yeah. Colo was not their favorite choice. <laughs> Jeanette was ostracized from her community. And uh, very, she was orthodox in her, her family. Uh, remains so today. It was difficult. I, I know. Jeanette made difficult choices for her life every day. She was an extraordinary person. She really was an amazing person. Exit Art started off, on, as I said, at 25, I think it was $25,000, no, $2,500 they got. $2,500 and they went out and rented a space for 500 bucks a month, you know? So they had five months, you know? <laughs> and uh, at the end it was about a, a million five, budget that they had to raise every year. Now this money is raised uh, through donors, through portfolios, through writing grants, night and day. Uh, I, I know there were times, I personally know there were times where Jeanette, Exit Art existed because Jeanette's credit cards um, carried it for periods of time. It was their passion, it was uh, their life's work, and they gave it everything. Yeah, hi. Good to see you. Was the decision to liquidate it, was it financial or was it because it felt like it was being a thing and, and it really should be left? Yeah, exactly. 
wasn't financial. There was a board in place, a very prestigious board that could have kept Exeter going. Uh, but it was their wish. It always was their wish. We tried for years <laughs> to say, how about training some young people here? You know, how about this transition, uh, that kind of thing. But it, it, I think it, to really understand it uh, of what it was, it was their love affair and it was their life and it was that they, they always saw it that way. Colo and her together saw it as a kind of performance piece, a piece of theater. Colo saw everything, or sees, I should say, he's certainly still with it. Colo is very impressed with the notion that everything is a story, everything is a narrative, everything is theater. And he, would do, he did a number of shows uh, uh, where the theater of painting, he would call it, and so forth. And he would, so, so exit art was theater, and it was a long play, which they had no intention of ending at the point that it did, uh, unhappily. Um, but that's how things go, and it, it, it was their complete desire that exit art close. Anyone else? Thank you so much for coming and uh, listening to what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you.